Okay, in the interest of time, I am going to just make three quick announcements um, for those who are here and the one relevant detail that I'll keep posting in the chat for those who haven't quite made it yet. Um, so welcome this morning, uh, glad you're here. I just wanna let you know that this presentation is being recorded um, and it will be made available for viewing later through the KU Libraries YouTube page. Um, users yourselves can click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen if you're interested in having subtitles. So you have the option there too of modifying the size if you'd like them to be larger or smaller. And then finally, I just wanna make sure, I know that there's a day full of events in association with the Engaged Learning Summit. So I just wanna make sure you have the link to be able to access that. So I am dropping that in the chat for everybody. Um, and at this point, I'm pleased to hand it over to my colleague, Kevin Smith, Dean of KU Libraries. We were just joking about the need to always say you're on mute and I almost did it. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. We're really glad you're joining us, whether you're joining us directly from the Community Engaged Learning and Scholarship Summit or specifically for the Engaged Leader Speaker Series keynote, welcome. As Emily said, I'm Kevin Smith. I'm the Dean of the Libraries at KU. And on behalf of the KU Libraries and the Commons, we're delighted to have you here this morning for a keynote presentation by Andrew Hoffman, the wholesome US Professor of Sustainable Enterprise at the University of Michigan. I want to begin with a sincere thank you to everyone who helped make this event possible. We are so pleased that following the success of last year's lecture featuring Kathleen Fitzpatrick, we've established this as a new lecture series, the Engaged Leader Speaking Series, Speaker Series. The purpose of this series is to bring the voices of leading engagement scholars to KU to lead intentional conversations that emphasize open, equitable, divergent and critical thinking poised to guide the future university. This series combines the institutional priorities of Jayhawks Rising, the strategic plan for the University of Kansas, by illuminating the work and structure of higher education through research and discovery with an eye toward healthy and vibrant communities, which depend on the well-being of students, faculty, and staff to make up the communities of KU. The libraries are pr proud to present this event in partnership with the Commons. Special thanks go to Susan Goodwin Thiel, Emily Rhine, and our Office of Communications and Advancement in the Libraries for their hard work in building this series and bringing us today's speaker. One housekeeping note before I introduce our speaker, we will aim to have time for questions following the presentation. So as we go, please feel free to put your questions into the chat and they will be handed to me and I'll ask them to, An to Andy as we go. So as I said, Andrew Hoffman is the wholesome US professor of sustainable enterprise at the University of Michigan, a position that holds joint appointments in the Stephen M. Ross School of Business, as well as the School of in the Environment for Environment and Sustainability. Professor Hoffman's research uses organizational behavior models and theories to understand the cultural and institutional aspects of environmental issues for organizations. He earned his master's and PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and has published 18 books, which have been translated into six languages. His work focuses on the processes by which environmental issues both emerge and evolve as social, political, and managerial issues. He also writes about the role of academic scholars in public and political discourse. And on that topic, we are very fortunate to have Andy here with us today to talk about his book, The Engaged Scholar, Expanding the Impact of Academic Research in Today's World, in which he argues for the emergence of a more publicly and politically engaged scholar. So please help me welcome Professor Andrew Hoffman. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, Sarah. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I so wish I could be there in person, but uh, we have to make do in these strange times. I'm going to share my screen and share my slides. And uh, I have about 25 minutes to make my case for you. So I'm going to jump right into it with a question. And this is the question that motivates this book. This is a question that motivates my inquiry in this area. 
why did you choose to become a professor? I mean, this is a very simple question and it's a question I often come back to when I start to lose track of the meaning or purpose behind my work. Because for me, the answer to that question is very simple. I want my research, teaching and engagement to have an impact on the world around me. I wanna make a difference in the world through my role as an academic. The standard metrics of our day, citation counts, A-level publications, H-index, they pale in comparison to that singular objective that I hold for myself. And it's very hard to hold true to that objective. We are surrounded by institutions <clears throat> that drive us in a direction, to my mind, away from what is inherently for me an intrinsic motivation and we focus on the extrinsic. Let me offer a story to illustrate that point. Um, before COVID, <clears throat> I gave a talk, a seminar on my topic on business and sustainability uh, to a bunch of scholars on business sustainability. And in the Q&A, <clears throat> we got into this, this track of, are we having a difference in the real world? And some people were pushing back on me <clears throat> when I questioned whether we were. And I said, okay, let's do a little survey. And so I said, how many people are concerned about the issue of climate change? Everyone raised their hand. And then I asked how many people are doing research on climate change? And almost everybody kept their hand up. Then I asked how many people are direct directing that research at A-level academic publications? All the hands stayed raised. And then I said, how many think another A-level publication is gonna do anything about the issue of climate change and all the hands came down? This is the reality we are living in. We have these external metrics, these external objectives, and to my mind, they're getting in the way for some of us who want to have an impact in real world debates. I want to advocate for the idea of integrating engagement much more deeply into who we are as academics, what our identity is, how we practice our craft. Not everyone has to do this, but I just wanna make it easier for those who choose to take this path to both learn how to do it and to fit it within the reward systems that are in play within the academia. There's my case. Let me see if I can put some meat on those bones and make it stronger. We are now <clears throat> living in a very difficult time. Uh, the RAND Corporation produced that report right there called Truth Decay. And they come to four conclusions that are quite disconcerting. Number one, we are just debating facts. Number two, we are blurring fact and opinion. Number three, we are distrusting previously trusted sources of information, otherwise known as the academy. And number four, we've never seen anything like this. And social media is a big driver of it. This is the existential crisis of our time. How can we address any kind of issue, whether it's climate change or, or vaccines and autism or endocrine disruption? How do we address any issue if we can't agree on a basic set of facts? And to my mind, that challenge, that threat lays the gauntlet at the door of the academy. Creating knowledge, creating wisdom is our stock and trade. And if we choose not to bring that to the world, other people will, and in fact are, bringing it to the world for great impact for particular agendas. And we need to recognize what is going on out there and start to bring ourselves into this debate. Um, the National Geographic had a cover story called The War on Science, People are Distrusting Science. Uh, the flood of pseudoscientific journals is confusing the public. Uh, I've been invited to be an editor in chief of a medical journal, an engineering journal. I'm totally unqualified, but these journals are not serious. <clears throat> In fact, there are journals out there, you can pay money and publish anything you want. And some of them are obviously illegitimate and some of them are not. One that's obviously illegitimate, I put it there on the page, and two scholars wanted to prove what a joke these, these, uh, these journals were. And so they actually published a paper. You can look it up and excuse the language for one second, but it's, a, it's called, take me off your fucking mailing list. And it just has that sentence over and over again. Now, obviously that's a joke, but there is a lot of research out there that people can't tell that it's politically motivated or just plain false. Down at the bottom, why scientists disagree about global warming. It's produced by a group that calls itself the NIPCC, not the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but the NIPCC, the Non-Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is actually put forward by the Heartland Institute, which is one of the leading climate skeptic groups in the country. The important point is, they, pu they published tens of thousands of these and sent them free of charge to K through 12 science teachers trying to change the curriculum in K through 12 education. This is what we're up against. <clears throat> and to my mind, if we sit on the sidelines, we'll have more phenomenon like what they're on the right with the Pew Research Center showing wide gaps between what science says 
and what public believes. And we can see that very vividly in, in, in COVID right now. And so to my mind, we have to step into the debate. The problem is I think academia is having a crisis of relevance of its own. Oops, excuse me. Um, people are not reading our work. They're not listening to what we have to say. And in fact, many Americans don't even understand what science does, how it does it, what its conclusions are and what they mean. And we need to change that. It's very important that we do. How urgent is the problem before us? I'm gonna give you two views. One, you know, Mark Schlissel, uh, president of the University of Michigan, points out that we forget the privilege it is to have lifelong security of employment at a spect spectacular university. And I don't think we use it for its intended purpose. I think on, on average, faculty are becoming a bit more careerist and staying inside our comfort zones. And if we're seen as perceived as an ivory tower or talking to one another, being proud of our discoveries and our awards, in the long run, people's support for what we do is gonna suffer. And you can see that in state houses around the country. Jane Lubchenco, when she was chair of the, uh, the American Association of Advancement of Science, said we have a social contract. Science has a social contract to bring our work to the public, to inform public debate. We have to do this, we should do this. Now that's one view, it's our obligation. Another view is we better do it or we're in big trouble. The Economist had an article saying, is higher ed going the way of the big three, ignoring the threats that are at our doorstep, at our peril? President Michael Crow at Arizona State, it goes even further. He says, we're increasingly filled with hubris, filled with arrogance, cut off from the general public, unable to find an appropriate tone with which to communicate. But we need to do this. People want to know what we're doing, why we exist, why they're giving us money. This is a very serious thing we need to focus on. I'll let you decide which it is. I personally think it's a very serious issue and we need to address it. This has been a problem for a while though. If you go back to World War II, uh, the United States won the war, science helped them do it. And the president of the United States commissioned Vannevar Bush to come up with a report on how science can help inform society and policy on serious issues. And he produced this report in 1945 called Science, the Endless Frontier. And there's where the foundations of the distinction between basic research and applied research got set. And they're still with us today where applied research is <clears throat> done somebody, by somebody else, we do basic research in the academy. And that has to change. And so Donald Stokes with Pasteur's Quadrant presents an idea that we have to use use and we have to develop use inspired research. Um, does it have basic research in service of specific immediate problems? Yes. Is it con consistent with a quest for fundamental understanding? Yes, that's Pasteur's quadrant. That's what we need to aim for, research that's rigorous, but also relevant. And that's what I'd like to see us do more of. Now, the problem is <clears throat> the rewards of academia are not geared in that direction. And as I said, academia is facing a crisis of relevance of its own. We produce roughly 2 million research articles per year in about 28,000 journals. The average academic paper, however, is cited only 10.8 times between 2000 and 2010, and 4.67 for the social sciences, my field. In fact, 80% of 82% of humanities articles are never cited, nor were 32% in the social sciences, 27% in the natural sciences, and 12% in medicine. This is a very serious problem, and we have to think about how we're going to handle this. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from our formal rewards. We have an A journal theory fetish. This is Don Hambrick's point that we are producing work that speaks to each other and not to the general public. There are also informal rewards, what's called the Carl Sagan effect, a view that if you engage in general public discourse, you must not be a serious academic. You must not be, have the chops to do it. Both of these problems stand in the way. But if we don't remove them, we have several problems to face not least of which, if the purpose of an academic paper is for me to put a line on my resume and to get a great job at a great university, people do have a right to ask, what are we doing? But it also leads to other problems. <clears throat> the A-level journal focus, it's a very limited audience. It's a specific kind of journal, a specific kind of audience. It can lead to less creative and diverse research. It can guarantee irrelevance. How long does it take for your paper to come out? You could start a paper today on COVID, When's it gonna come out in the academic journals? Two, three, four years? Will it still be relevant? Will it still be helpful? And therefore it'll have questionable impact. And there are many people who are pushing against this. For the book, I was able to have a brief conversation with Paul Krugman, 
And I asked him, why did the work you published uh, that, that got you your Nobel Prize in economics, why was it all published in B journals? And his answer was because the A's wouldn't take it. It wasn't down that main street path of what the A's call legitimate research. Randy Sheckman, a Nobel Prize winning self physiologist, announced that his, his lab will not publish in the luxury journals of his field, Nature, Cell, and Science, because he felt that it created a distorting idea of what are the legitimate tracks of research. And so if we don't come out of this, if we don't recognize the rules of engagement, how they're getting us in the wrong direction, we've got a serious problem. <clears throat> we need to teach people new rules of engagement. And here's a rub, here's a real challenge. A lot of my generation, and I'm 60 years old, uh, don't know how to do this. And so how do we teach the younger generation how to do this? This is a real problem. We need to teach new skills, new techniques, new purpose to what we do as academics. I begin by saying, I think of broadening my conception of the classroom. Students come into my classroom, they pay tuition, we have a contract, social contract, they come and they learn and they do their assignments and hopefully they come out with an expanded knowledge base. But that isn't the only place where I think of my classroom. I will give talks to trade associations, I'll give talks to government officials, nonprofit groups, I'll give talks to the local high school. I think of my classroom as much broader than the students that come into my classroom. I think this is important, especially for some of us who are at public universities. I think our obligations are much broader than those who pay tuition dollars. We also have to recognize their political implications of engage, engagement. This is tricky territory. Um, I, for example, uh, do research and write about climate change and public perceptions of climate change. It can get pretty nasty out there in the public debate. I actually have a folder for hate mail. I get hate mail because of what I write about. And you have to understand that there's a different set of rules out there in public debate. And we need to learn how to play by those rules and understand how to, um, to work within them. So for example, you need to find your voice. It takes time to really get the confidence and the base and the foundation to speak with authority on certain issues. But when you find it, you'll know it. And you will speak with a clarity because you have the models and the theories and the ideas in your head over years of development. A second point, tell stories. Stories stick, it's very interesting. You know, Alan Alda, an actor, created the Stony Brook Center for Science Communication. I'm on a committee with the National Academies of Sciences on the science of science communication. Our last conference, it was in Irvine just before COVID. What was the central theme? How to tell stories. People remember stories. Avoid the knowledge deficit model. The idea is, the knowledge deficit model is, I approach people, their brain is half full. I'm going to pour knowledge, my, my knowledge into their brain. I'm going to fill it up. They're going to think like me, and they're going to make smart decisions. That doesn't work. People don't like that. They resent that. Um, you need to engage. It has to be a two-way conversation. You need to be accessible, which means you need to know your audience. You don't just parachute in, give your talk, step right out. You have to find a different language. I often think about being multilingual. You know, I have a dual appointment. I can put on my business suit, walk into a business conference, give a talk on operational efficiency, cost of capital, consumer demand. And I can put on my flannel shirt and my jeans and go give a talk to Sierra Club and talk about climate change, radiative forcing. You need to be multilingual. You need to rely also on solid research. There's a lot of research being developed on how to communicate science. When you say something, what do you mean? What do they hear? And lastly, change your publication strategy. How are you going to get your work out there. Right now, the dominant mode for most people is write a paper, submit it to an A journal, the paper comes back, revise and resubmit, you do multiple rounds, you get the paper accepted, it goes into the queue, you move on to the next paper, and as we get further in our career, we have multiple papers, always following down that track. The world is changing, the world is changing rapidly, and the channels before us are huge. So you write your paper, then write a short piece that goes out into a blog or an op-ed or something like that. Get it out into the public. And then maybe you'll get a call. Will you speak about this at a conference? Will you come on the radio or the TV and talk about it? Add this to your portfolio. This is important. People are not gonna come to the academy to find our work. We need to bring our work to the public. This is very, very important. And many of us, the, the options we have for doing this are growing daily. Which means you need to embrace social media. Social media is such a powerful tool for communicating. And 
I know a lot, again, in my generation who don't want to have anything to do with it. And then the younger generation are starting to move in and take this very seriously. But many of us don't understand it. Let me give you an example. When I was a doctoral student, the way I did research was I went to the library. I decided I wanted a particular article. I went up to the stacks. I found it in a book, a bound book. I brought it down to the table. I found the article. I read it. I Xeroxed it. I Xeroxed it. Uh, I went through the bibliography. I found another article and repeat. And this is how I did my research. Today, students go to Google Scholar. Now, this changes your research strategy. It changes the research output. It is extremely influential. And let me ask you, how many of you know how Google Scholar works? I can give you the answer. You don't. The proprietary technology is not available to us. We don't know exactly how Google Scholar works. And yet, would anyone deny that Google Scholar is centrally important to who gets our research, how they get it, whether it's in the scholarly community or the public community? How do people, how do these algorithms work? How do these search engines work? We need to start to understand that if we want people to find our work. And it's not just Google, it's Elsevier, it's Web of Science, Scopus. There are a whole host of social media platforms that are out there for sweeping the web, finding our work, making it accessible. To do that, to understand how that works, you need to understand how DOI numbers work. You need to understand how an ORCID count works. Think of them, the first one. The second one is a social security number. All your papers will be connected to you through your ORCID number. A DOI number is what those web crawlers are looking for. Say, that's an academic paper. It has a DOI number. So if you produce something and it doesn't get a DOI number, hold your breath. Are these search engines going to be able to find it? I'm very pleased that here at the University of Michigan, our central repository for academic work uh, and student work, for that matter, is something called Planet Blue. Anything that gets deposited there now gets a DOI number. This is so important for getting the work out there. And then there are also places that are distributing our work, whether it's a social science research network, which is a, a working paper aggregator, or academia.edu, ResearchGate, or Mondelay. There are plenty of platforms out there to do this. Now, I hope your head's starting to spin because there are more platforms that we can, than we can individually get involved in. It would just take all your time to manage all these sites. So choose wisely, choose carefully, understand the pros and cons of each, but don't ignore it. Understand this landscape and figure out how to use it to your best uh, advantage. Even things like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn are tremendously influential for getting our work out there. There's a lot of very interesting research, largely coming out of the medical field to show that there's a very strong positive correlation between how much an article is tweeted and how much it's cited. And a lot of academics report going to Twitter or Facebook to find academic work, to find lay work or practitioner work that's relevant to their field, to engage in conversations. It's not all just the, the rage machine that we think of when we think of Twitter. LinkedIn is much more uh, polite, much more professional, and Facebook as well. Uh, in, in, in an interesting way, one of my doctoral students a couple of years ago told me they were interviewing for a job at an academic institution. And the academic institution asked for their social media um, profiles because they wanted to see who are they following and who's following them. It's actually started to work into the job search process, which says, says something about how things are changing. Social media goes further too. There are plenty of outlets right now for you to get your work out into the general public. Uh, I publish in all of, well, I don't publish in the monkey cage, but I've published in these others. And they are different audiences and different uh, filters. I mean, the Corporate Eco Forum is very important for me for reaching business people who care about sustainability. Footnote, more uh, for the environmental stuff. Medium is an interesting out, out, uh, 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 platform, similar with Substack. No filtering, no editing. So you get what you get. Uh, but I can tell you Malcolm Gladwell, and Paul Kingsnorth and others are using Substack. Uh, and I've seen some really interesting essays on Medium. And then one I particularly like, and uh, it's called The Conversation. I published there quite a bit. And so you act, write your academic paper, you make a pitch, you send it to them, they accept it, they give you an editor, you write 700 words, they edit it for you, they polish it, and then it goes out. And it goes under a Creative Commons license, so anyone can repost it as long as they credit the source. And so I've posted stuff there that has come out in numerous outlets that are hungry 
or the content that we can provide. Um, they are uh, going out there and, and, and searching the conversation and putting it on their page as news. And this is, we don't need journalists anymore to get directly to the public. We can go directly at them. The monkey cage is more directed at, at economists but, or political scientists. But again, there's so many platforms out there. And I have colleagues who say, Andy, I don't have time to do this. And I just roll my eyes, like, for goodness sake, you spent three, four years publishing your academic paper. You don't have an afternoon to sum it up in 700 words. I don't believe that. Take the time, bring your work to the public. You can do this. And then there's a lot of effort to try and measure the impact of this work. Uh, impact story is trying to measure it at the level of the scholar, altmetric at the level of the paper, Plum Analytics is out there. What I, want, what I want you to see there, there's a lot of money behind this. How do we measure impact in the broader world? These are still in their infancy. They're still being developed, but the Sloan Foundation, the National Science Foundation, Taylor and Francis, they're all trying to figure out how to measure this because let's face it, when we come up for a promotion and tenure, we love numbers, citation counts, A-level publications, H-index. What kind of numbers can go against this to say, this is your level of impact. This is how we can measure it. And they're trying to figure this out. So the world is changing as we speak. Social media is a huge part of it. Ignore it at your peril. The last point I want to make is I want you to think about this in terms of the arc of your career. I and mean, one problem I have with what we do is that I never thought about what it meant to be an assistant professor until I became one or an associate professor until I became one. Uh, eventually I'll become an emeritus professor. I'm starting to think about that now. What does that mean? How will I play that role? And if you can start to think about the arc of your career, you can start to think about how to work engagement into it. Now it's, you know, doctoral students, assistant professors, you're in an apprentice system and academic publications are the corner of the realm. So you got to learn that. But over time, can you bring engagement more centrally into what you do? I think this is important. I think of our jobs like a jazz musician. At the beginning, you have to learn your scales. So doctoral students, learn your scales. Over time, you learn how to play other jazz. And then over time, you learn how to play your own jazz. And there's the beauty of the full professor that I don't think is fully realized. Going back to Mark Schlissel's point, I, we have many full professors who are acting like associate or assistant professors, continuing to do what they did before. And being a full professor is a wonderful opportunity to really make a difference in the world out there. Uh, I heard it once suggested that once you become full, you have to write a book summing up your 14, 15 years of academic research into a composite whole, and you have to write it for a, a lay audience. What an experience that would be. How would that change your conception of who you are as an academic and what you have to work, offer the world around you? By the same token, doctoral students, you can't check all interest and engagement. Put it aside, wait till your associate are full and then expect to re-engage the passion will have died. So you start small, you build it slowly. As you advance in your career, you start to grow your level of engagement. It's that simple. While also recon recognizing that the world is changing as you're advancing through these stages. In the words of Wayne Gretzky, go where the puck is going, don't go where the puck is. And so the world you are gonna be in, doctoral students right now, the world you're gonna be in as an associate or full professor is gonna be very different than the world we're facing right now. We can see some changes going on right now. One, there's a generational shift going on within academia. More young people want to get involved in engagement. They want their work to have practical impact. This is encouraging to me. I can tell you when I became through as a, a doctoral student, if I announced to my committee, I, I don't want to be an academic, there was a good chance someone would have qu quit my career. Um, that's happening less and less, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that. So the younger generation is coming in with ideas and expectations as they start to fill the ranks of those who set the rules, the rules will change. We are also trying to figure this out. There's numerous uh, centers on academic engagement. I think every university should have one, whether you know, here I have Stony Brook, Northwestern, UMass, Michigan has one now as well. The National Academies is trying to figure this out. The AAAS is trying to figure this out. How do we communicate with the public? This will change our institutions. And we're seeing the institutions change. <clears throat> On the upper left, we're late. We had a group of doctoral students and postdocs here at the University of Michigan who said, you know what? If you're not gonna teach us, we're gonna teach ourselves. And so they have all these seminars to teach each other. How do you talk to the public? How do you talk to a journalist? How do you talk to a politician? The ASA has produced a report on how to work public communication into tenure and promotion. The accrediting group that accredits business schools, the ACSB, has added impact 
to its accreditation process. The Mayo Clinic has included social media scholarship in its uh, advancement programs. Here at the school I teach at, where we typically have three criteria for our annual review, teacher, teaching, research, and service. We've added a fourth called practice. And there's a group in my field called RRBM, Responsible Research and Business Management, trying to get the top journals to focus on more research that has practical relevance. The world is changing. And if you can think about it at the beginning of the S curve, will it keep on going? Will it die stillborn? It remains to be seen. But the more experiments like this, the more adoption and spread, the more contagion, it will change very, very rapidly in, in, in an S curve format. And so I'm hopeful that will happen. That's part of my mission in this book. That's part of my mission in this talk. And I applaud Kansas for engaging in this conversation. I think it's so important for the future of the academy, for the vitality of the academy, for the relevance of the academy. Let me close with two final thoughts. One, I found this essay in 1963 in Science Magazine. I encourage you to look it up. It's a one page essay. It was written by a, a researcher at the Mayo Clinic and it's called Chaos in the Brickyard. And he wrote this little parable. He described a world where you had people who were brick, brick makers. They made little bricks. And then the builder would take those bricks and build an edifice. If they needed more bricks, they'd order more bricks. If they needed a bricks of a certain size, they'd request those bricks. And then something happened in this world and brick making got out of hand where they were making bricks irrespective of their purpose to the builder. He asked at the end, is this the future we're facing? Are we gonna become a field of brick makers? I fear that the answer to that question now is we are becoming a field of brick makers, whether it's our academic publications or I had a scholar tell me one time, also with our doctoral students, we wanna recreate ourselves, yet we need to create doctoral students who are gonna be themselves for the world they're entering. So are we brick makers? How do we change that? I hope I inspire you to think about that carefully and to push that even further. Here's a quote from the Mayo Clinic when they announced they're gonna add social media to their advancement process. The moral and societal duty of an academic healthcare provider, and you can replace that with academic in any discipline, is to advance science, approve the care of his or her patients, and share knowledge. A very important part of this role requires physicians to participate in public debate, responsibly influence opinion, and help our patients navigate the complexities of healthcare. As clinician educa educators, our job is not to create knowledge obscura, trapped in ivory towers, and only accessible to the enlightened. The knowledge we create and manage needs to impact our communities. I think we in academia live very privileged lives and we have a very important role in society. We have an opportunity, in fact, I think an obligation to inform society on what our work tells us, to tell the public what science does, how it does it, what are its inclusions and why are they important for the world we live in today. We need more and more engaged scholars to be able to play this role in order to inform the public. I hope my remarks stir enough of you to add this to your portfolio. Those who already do, I hope my remarks affirm your decision to do this and continue to do it to great effect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andy, for that really important talk. Uh, I, I'm seeing appreciation in the, uh, in the chat. Um, I want to. I we're we're going to put questions in the chat, and I'm going to relay them to you. I'm going to take the uh, the um, moderator's privilege of asking you a question while others uh, get entered into the chat. Um, I want to ask specifically my role um, for most of my career as a librarian. I've been an advocate for open access to scholarship. That's been a big part of my career. Most of what I've done has been to make more accessible those A-list publication articles, those very technical articles that arguably very few people will understand. So uh, the, the really blunt way of asking my question is, have I been wasting my time? Uh, is there a better way for us, the libraries that support open access, is there a better way for us to, um, to approach that mission? Are you wasting your time? No. Um, what you're doing Good. is very, very important. Thank you. Um, there's, a, there's an issue though. We can make our academic papers available. Um, 
will people understand them and how to put them into context? And I don't mean to demean the general public, but I think we need to also provide a different language. As I said, become multilingual. Um, I will often challenge my doctoral students. Uh, if you can't explain your research to your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, I wonder whether you understand it. Um, if, you can do, if you can't do it without the jargon, because most people don't understand the jargon. And they also, there are words we use that don't translate. There's uncertainty in the science. Well, that's a statistical question for the general public. That means, oh, you don't really know. And so we really need to learn how to communicate and bring it to the public in a form that they understand and can see. And I think it's very interesting. I mean, what we're going through with COVID right now is changing what we do and how we do it. I mean, this online engagement we're doing right now is becoming more and more the norm, not just here, but also in the classroom. And that poses a very serious challenge to academia because we now have asynchronous content and synchronous content is part of our lexicon. Leaving aside that asynchronous content used to be a book, now it's more video format, it's more engaging. I had a colleague tell me, yeah, I do asynchronous content, I do a, a video of a voiceover in my PowerPoint deck. And I think if that's how we're gonna to adapt to the changing world, we're dead. We need to produce much more high quality visual content and take full advantage of the capabilities of social media to allow education to be tailored to the individual student. So I, I, Kevin, keep on going keep doing it, but I will also try and encourage some level of translation and opening up of other channels, other ways to reach certain audiences and not just making the academic papers available. Thank you. Uh, because of the late start, we are going to go a little bit past the 11 o'clock hour. So I, I really wanna get in this important question. Uh, the questioner says, I really appreciate this talk and the entire message is something I truly believe in. I also recognize that you address to you, Andy, that you're speaking from your own positionality as a white presenting man. How do you suggest people of color and women engage in these multilingual spaces? In particular, people of color and women face a different kind of backlash on social media. So and then the question goes on, what role does the institution play in protecting faculty from harassment in public discourse? This is, this is a, such an important question. Uh, I organized a conference on this topic in 2015, and uh, we had a speaker who, I don't wanna get, but she talked about this as a woman, that the, you know, the trolls go after women, minorities more than white men, this is a fact. Um, and so it makes it much more challenging. Um, uh, and you gotta figure out, how are you gonna play the game and when you play the game? And, and, and this woman had an interesting point. She said, if you're getting involved in a debate and she looked at misogyny in the gaming industry, you can imagine the kind of garbage that she got. But she said, you can choose not to get, get into social media, but someone else is gonna create a media identity for you and you're not gonna like what they create. So you kind of have to, to step in, be prepared for the blowback and it doesn't make it any easier. Um, get a support network. I mean, uh, understand how to deal with it. There's a lot of good work out there on how to deal with trolls. Um, that doesn't make it any easier, especially when it gets personal and especially if it gets threatening. And as I said, women and minorities get it more than white men. And, but I have been threatened on, um, I just got a, yesterday, a voice message that was very threatening that I had to turn over to the police. Um, it's interesting, when I first started getting hate mail, I got, it really stung me. I didn't know what to do with it. And someone gave me a quote and they've attributed it to Winston Churchill, but I can't verify it, but it's a great quote. He said, if you're not offending anyone, you never took a stand. And this is important. If you're gonna say something important, if you're gonna challenge how people think or behave, you're gonna get blowback. Everybody is, people don't like change. Um, someone else gave me a quote from Paul Newman. He says, if you don't have enemies, you don't have character. So. If you enter into public discourse, if no one reacts, you're probably not saying that anything that provocative. If people do react, they will react to what you say, but they can also react to who you are. You know, Catherine Hayhoe, a climate scientist at Texas Tech, has gotten some awful stuff sent to her, uh, awful stuff. Um, she'd be a great role model and educator on how, how to deal with that kind of garbage. So I don't wanna in any way diminish the question because it's a very important question and those who are more vulnerable to attack or more prone to be attacked 
need to go in with eyes wide open of what can happen and have strategies for dealing with it, whether it's a support network, understanding when it's just noise, when it's actually threatening, because for the most part, trolls, they're not gonna come knocking on your office door, but you always have to be careful. Thank you. The, the next question that I have in the queue, I have read about teach outs at the University of Michigan. Are these online community engagement courses worth the effort to create similar programs at places like KU? I actually don't know what they are. Ah. <laughs> Oops. Well, um, yeah, I'm afraid yeah. I don't know what those are. Well, maybe the questioner can explain and I'll move on to the next question in the interest of time. As an older person who has been long, long been creeped out by the business model of social media platforms, mm -hmm. is there a way to begin using the common platforms without surrendering to them? Or should I just relax and sign up? They are vacuums that suck you in and you really have to be disciplined and, and be careful. I mean, for, for, if, you, if you spend too much time on Twitter, it is a rage machine. There's plenty of research to show you that it just, it feeds negative tweets. That's what it does. And so you really have to put up some good blinders to not get sucked into it, to focus on what you wanna focus on. And that means you need to understand how the platforms work. And that could be a very useful service, Kevin, that you could provide as well as how does Twitter work? How does Facebook or LinkedIn work? Not just in terms of the internal guts of it, but how do I operate it in a way that allows me to limit the kind of static and noise that I don't wanna get and really focus on the kind of quality content that I do wanna get. And there are techniques and strategies for doing that. And it's very important. So I would encourage your questioner to put your toe in the water, wade in carefully, get some education on how it works and try and limit the extent to which the negativity and the vortex of that negativity can come back at you. Thank you. I'm going to ask you one more question, even though we're really uh, pushing the time, but it's here and I want to ask it. I'm wondering if you can provide advice for those of us working in more traditional departments who are resistant to this kind of public facing work. I've seen public facing work de uh, denigrated as less serious and pandering. Like mm -hmm. the earlier question, this seems to happen more often when that work is done by women and BIPOC scholars. Yeah, yeah, th th that's, that's a great question. I mean, the Carl Sagan effect is alive and it's real. And if you're not familiar with Carl Sagan and the metaphor, Carl Sagan was an extremely influential astrophysicist who was denied admission to the National Academies of Sciences. And people feel that they, he was denied admission because he was a popularizer, a hack. Um, even at my own school, when I was doing my, my graduate studies, Lester Thoreau, a very respected economist, became dean and he decided as dean he was going to start writing trade books. And his fellow economists started calling him less thorough, started to mock him. And yes, this will happen more to women and minorities than it will to men, white men in particular. So, so that is a serious issue. I know a lot of scholars who do this, who do not publicize it. Um, there was a survey of UK scholars on just on the general topic of being an academic and on the question of engagement. A lot of them left it blank. But those that filled it in on the question of how do you measure and track engagement, a lot of them said, please don't, because we do this our way, we do this because we want to, this is part of our identity. And once you put in metrics, people will chase the metrics and you're gonna ruin this. So, you know, I have doctoral students who have written op-eds and, and blogs. Be careful of how much you put that out there. Um, be smart about projecting your identity. Your identity as a doctoral student is to say, I'm ready to do academic work. As you get further along in your career, especially as you start to get the security of associate or full professor, you can be a little more out about this kind of activity. Like even here at the University of Michigan, the president really wants to support it. And he said, okay, well, first thing we'll do, we'll have a gala dinner celebrating people who do this. Well, guess what? A lot of people didn't come because it's really not something that they want to broadcast for fear of the, the denigrating backlash that may come. So just be smart about this. The, we can, we can approach the world as we wish it to be, but you have to approach the world as it is. And, uh, and so um, just that, that, that's, that's my best advice. 
Well, thank you for that. And thank you everyone for your attendance today. I want to take just a moment to mention an exciting research and, and teaching grant opportunity for KU faculty and academic staff sponsored by the KU Libraries. The KU Libraries will host Sprints Week, uh, May 16th through the 20th. Our Sprints Week committee is now welcoming applications from faculty who wish to collaborate with a team of expert librarians for one week on a research or instruction project. There's a $1,000 stipend involved. And if you're interested, please plan on attending an information session Thursday, February 8th from 3 to 4 p.m. And the details should be available in the chat. At least that's what they tell me. <laughs> Finally, thank you again, Andrew, for sharing your time, your energy, and your ideas, your passion with us at the University of Kansas. I hope that we will listen to what you have to say, and I hope that everybody who is tuned in here has a wonderful day. Thanks a lot. Thank you.